I know with all of the cutting edge and exciting things that are going on in the world, the humble old relational database dating back now 50 years is a topic that I'm going to start talking about. And I've got to tell you, I've got to be honest with you, there is another timeline, there is a parallel universe where I would not be up here talking about this. And there is a parallel universe where you would not be in this auditorium right now. But I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. And I want to talk about why I think this is still relevant in this day and age, how I got here, and really focus not on the language necessarily, but some of the underlying concepts that when you understand those, those concepts are going to drive your decisions when you're doing database design. Those concepts are going to drive your decisions when you're trying to optimize these databases and scale. So we are on this timeline. We are in this parallel universe where I'm up here talking about this. But I think it's, I think it's worth taking a moment to talk about how I got here. I started my career as a software engineer professionally in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And at that time, for better or for worse, my language that I programmed in was the humble old Visual Basic. Not VB.net that actually has some OO concepts. The humble old Visual Basic. And I'm looking at the room right now and there's a lot of younger people, and I think that's a good thing because if nothing else, it means you might never have had to wrestle with this language and all of the poor implementations it allowed. I don't think it was a bad language, but I think it was a very forgiving language, and it made it very easy to make bad decisions and put those bad decisions in production. And, uh, you know, once things go into production, they never come back. And around uh, the early 2000s, something was changing in the industry. While in the 1990s, Visual Basic was a very popular language, Microsoft was moving over to all of the .NET. And if you remember .NET in the early 2000s, basically Microsoft had done what Microsoft did in that era, which was take something like Java, and then they would file the serial number off of it and release it under a new name. And that was C-sharp. Now, it hadn't quite reached its tipping point, and there was still a lot of need to keep maintaining these old Visual Basic applications. And so, of course, uh, I picked the worst time possible to pick up, leave where I was living in the United Kingdom, and move back to the United States. Because at that point, essentially, everybody was fleeing the Visual Basic jobs that they knew was never, ever going to change that you are going to be the next generation of COBOL programmers maintaining awful, gnarly legacy code that uh, and you would never have a relevant career skill set ever again. And all of, the, all of those developers were fleeing to the .NET positions for all of the new, interesting, exciting development. But my problem was I didn't have enough exposure to .NET yet, to C Sharp yet, to really be a serious candidate for those jobs. And at the same time, I didn't want to go to those Visual Basic jobs in the US because I knew that that would be a hole, that would be a pit that I would never be able to climb out of. And it was just, I had three options. I could either take the career momentum that I had built and go back to the starting line, go back to the beginning and get a job as a, as a junior developer, which I really didn't want to do. I could lie. I could try to lie my way through a job interview, and it turns out I wasn't good at that. Or the third option was I could find some other path. And when I was going through my career, all the places that I worked, I found that almost nobody wanted to deal with the database. Almost nobody wanted to deal with SQL Server or MySQL or Oracle or any of those things. And so I just sort of stepped into that, and I enjoyed it. And so I was sort of the de facto subject matter expert for relational databases and SQL in these jobs that I worked at. And I'd gotten kind of a useful skill set there. So as I was looking for jobs in the United States, I just found myself thinking, it's too bad there's no such thing as a SQL developer job. And then I typed that into the job search engine. It turns out there were hundreds of them. 
And so I was able to come in and actually not lie in my interview, not lie on my resume, not inflate my experience. I could come in there and, and, and hit the ground running, very good SQL developer for this company. And that's what I did. I was a SQL developer, I was a DBA, a development DBA, I was a data architect, and I really moved up that career path for a number of years. Now eventually, I will say this, and anybody who's spent some time working with SQL knows this, that there is a limited number, there is a finite number of select statements any one human can write in their life before they go insane. And I had passed that years ago. And I decided that I was done, I never wanted to do this again, and I started looking for jobs in more of a broader, full-stack type of uh, capacity. And I walked in, I said, look, I'm going to be really honest with you. I have a lot of depth with SQL Server. I don't have a lot of depth with C Sharp. And they said to me, well, that's perfect, because we've got a room full of developers that have a ton of depth with C Sharp and zero depth with SQL Server. So I think you're going to balance the team out nicely. And that helped me transition into different roles and different capacities. But what I found since then, and this was 15 plus years ago, that those skills are still relevant today and they still keep me relevant today as well. And they, they keep me busy, they keep me employed, they keep me uh, being able to afford to come out here and uh, spend some time with all of you wonderful folks. Uh, you know, as we, as we look at uh, all of the emerging trends and the new exotic databases and new SQL and no SQL and all the rest of it, the Stack Overflow Developer Survey tells us the real story. And the real story is most of the top used databases in production today are still the humble relational databases. And, you know, we have tools that allow us to sort of pretend that those databases don't exist. I'm a big fan of abstraction. I remember years ago when we used to have to actually maintain all of these data access layers and libraries and things like that. And now we have tools that have really eliminated all of that. And I think tools like ORMs are incredibly useful, but to a point. But the reality is, as we scale, databases continue to be some of the biggest bottlenecks in everything that we do. And I think there's one more challenge, and that's the reason I'm up here today, is that SQL is a fairly simple language. We all know select, delete, update, where, inner join, left outer join, right outer join, right? The syntax is not hard, but the underlying paradigm that we have to work with is counterintuitive, particularly if you're coming from a, a functional or an OO background. And this is one of the areas where I think it helps to dive into some of these concepts. So because the language itself is straightforward, we're not going to be talking about the language. I think everybody here in this room generally understands the core language concepts. We're going to talk about some of these underlying concepts. We're going to talk a little bit about the internals because that's the knowledge that separates you from separate somebody who can just hack together a SQL query that will give the right answer and somebody who can craft database design queries that will perform well, that will scale well, and will be very long lived. So the things we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about indexing. We're going to talk about join operators and, the, and their underlying algorithms. I'm not going to talk about left joins and right joins necessarily. I'm going to talk about what happens in the storage engine when the when a join is executed, what these algorithms are. Because understanding those algorithms will drive indexing decisions and understanding those algorithms will desi drive design decisions and everything else that, that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about logical database design and again, understanding how the data is stored on disk, how the data is stored in memory really drives some of these things. We're going to talk a little bit about query optimization and we're going to close with just a few minutes on what the database community largely refers to as set thinking. That uh, the way that we think about making, performing transforms on sets of data rather than iterating through rows the way that we might iterate through a list or a collection in a database. So starting in the beginning with indexing, to understand indexing, I think it's important to understand how the data actually gets organized and stored on disk. 
So the, one of the fundamental data structures in a relational database is the B tree. And if you go back to your algorithms, data structures, everything else, you probably understand the, D, the B tree structure pretty well. It's a pretty simple structure. The idea is that we can efficiently traverse this tree to find the specific row that we want on one of those leaves. So whether it's a table or whether it's an index, the data is stored as a B tree. That, uh, that the data itself is stored in these, uh, these leaf nodes and all of the decision nodes and the root nodes allow you to quickly uh, traverse this structure to find the data in the leaf node. Now, I'm gonna use some language as we talk about this. I spent a lot of time with databases like SQL Server or MySQL. Uh, one thing that uh, can be a little bit confusing in something like MySQL is they use the nomenclature of a primary index and a secondary index. And there can be some confusion be between what we're calling a primary index and a primary key. Those are, those are different but sometimes overlapping ideas. So I'm gonna use the SQL Server uh, terminology which is clustered and non-clustered index. So if you're using SQL Server, it's a clustered index. If you're using MySQL, it's a primary index, but they mean the same thing and the ideas transfer across. So we'll use the clustered index rather than the primary index so there's no confusion and the non-clustered for the secondary index, although I may, I may find myself switching back and forth. I'm not entirely on India standard time yet and I'm definitely not uh, all there, but that's nothing new. Even when I'm home, I'm definitely not always there. So starting at the beginning, the primary index or the clustered index, it's basically your entire table. You know, a lot of times when we think about indexes, we think about the key of the index. And we think about maybe the key and a pointer to somewhere else in that index. But in the clustered index, the primary index, in fact, all of the columns for every row are stored in that clustered index, but it is keyed on whatever your index key is. Now, one of the things that we almost always do when we're creating a database table is we, uh, we as we start typing this out, if we ever type this out, create table, my table, uh, ID, int, identity, primary key, clustered, or primary index or primary key, or we don't even specify that it's the primary index, we just call it the primary key, and the database tells us, the da database just assumes, oh, well, if that's your primary key, you probably want that to be your primary clustered index. Uh, often, that's a, good, that's a good default. Often, that's a good rule of thumb, but not always. And as we go through some of this, we'll talk about what some of those exceptions are and why they exist. So your clustered index, your primary index, is all of the data that's in the table, all of the columns, all of the, for every row. <clears throat> but that data is going to be physically ordered by whatever that clustered key is. And again, typically we default to that being our primary key, but that doesn't always make sense. And so I like to think of the primary index to clustered index operating sort of like a phone book. And I stand up here in the year 2023, realizing that there are working developers today who have never seen a phone book. And I, I realize that that's, um, my, my references don't get any more current. But if you have ever seen a phone book, uh, when you look at this, it is optimized for you to find a phone number by name. So when you look, if we, if we kind of expand this out, just a little bit, you can see that, uh, that our root node is the book itself. Our decision nodes might be, uh, might be the context entries on the top of the page. And the leaf nodes are going to contain all of the data. And so if I want to go in the phone book and look up Michael Carducci, <clears throat> Well, I go, this data in the phone book is organized by last name, last name, first name. So I'm going to go find the C's, I'm going to find the CA's, I'm going to find the CR's, I'm going to scan down that page and find Carducci, and then you find my number. And that's 
really great for that type of data retrieval. Now, there's a couple of things that get challenging here. It's great for looking up by that key, but it's terrible opening up that phone book and saying, hey, somebody called me. I have a missed call from a number that I don't know. Let me see what the name is associated with that number. Well, then you have to go through every line, every entry on every page of the phone book to try to find that phone number. And that's why, that's why we have the secondary of the non-clustered indexes. Now, because your clustered index is essentially the, the whole table, uh, like Highlander, there can be only one. I told you my references weren't going to get any more current. And yes, that is a very old reference. Anyway, uh, there can be only one. So now we talk about the secondary index. And the secondary index is, allows a, is what allows us to do those lookups by things other than that, that clustered index key, like the phone number. So your secondary index is also a B tree, and it also contains a key. So if we wanted to create an index on phone number so we could do a reverse lookup, then that would contain a couple of things. It would contain uh, whatever we are keying that index on, in this case, phone number, and it's going to contain a pointer back to the clustered index. So when you seek through that B tree, you find that phone number that you're looking for, there will be a pointer back to the, to the clustered index where the rest of the row resides. And that's an important thing. Uh, both in uh, primary, secondary indexes, clustered, non-clustered indexes, when you get all the way down to the leaf nodes, they are also essentially double linked lists so that you can essentially scan forwards or backwards on those nodes, and that makes it really efficient to do some kind of range search. So for reasons I don't understand, I decided to create a table where I store all of the cards in a deck of cards. And this is kind of an example of, of what you might do. So you, we've got our surrogate key, a card ID. It's a monotonically increasing integer. Uh, and these are often a good, a good choice for keys for a lot of reasons, and we're going to talk about those as we go through. And then we have a value and a suit. So our clustered index is keyed on this card ID, but if I want to go into my deck of cards, and if we had the full 90 minutes that I usually give with this talk, there'd be a lot of fun things with cards, but uh, we'll do that on the breaks. Uh, I would need a secondary index. And that secondary index might look like this. If I want to be able to take a deck of cards and find all of the aces, uh, what is going to happen in there is I'm going to key that secondary index on the value of that card, and included in there is going to be that key to look up the row in the clustered index. So it's telling me that the first ace is at position 1, the second ace is at position 15, the third ace is at position 19, and the fourth ace is at position 35, and that's a pointer back to the clustered index. Now, great, we have indexes, and uh, indexes will make certain operations faster. But maybe you've had this happen. You've got a database query, the database query is slow, and you say, I know, I'll add an index. And you add the index, look at the query plan like this one here, and it says, hey, look at this. There's a possible key of ix value, but the key that I used, oh, I didn't use one. And you look at the database and you say, just in frustration, why you no use index? I should have one of those meme faces for that. But again, those, are, those memes are from 15 years ago. And again, my references don't get any more current. I'm getting old, and the world is changing around me, and it terrifies me. But let's talk about why this is, because remember that pointer. So what happens when you're doing a lot of these lookups, when you're using that secondary index, every time we do this, it has to, it, 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 the query optimizer is going to take your query, and it's going to decide, 
what is the best way to execute this query? What is the most efficient way to do this? And it's typically a cost-based optimizer with some heuristics and other rules in there, but it's gonna figure out what the cheapest way to run this query is. So it's gonna look at this and say, say, okay, based on the statistics that I have on this table, in order to use this index to satisfy this query, I think it's going to require me to do some number of lookups to satisfy this query. And so it says, okay, we're gonna seek to the first value in the index, and that's gonna be one cost unit. And then we've got that pointer, so now we're gonna do a seek in the clustered index to find the rest of the row to get the rest of the data out. That's one cost unit. And then we're gonna do another seek, and another lookup, another seek, another lookup, another seek, another lookup, over and over and over again, and the query optimizer estimates that we're gonna do this 30 times. Well, that's going to be 60 cost units. And then it says, well, it's only gonna take eight cost units to just scan the entire table, so that's gonna be the most optimum solution. And this is where it gets useful to, know a f to have a few uh, tricks up your sleeve, as it were. And one of them is something called a covering index. And this is a trick that we figured out a couple of decades ago to fool the query optimizer. Basically, if we know that our particular query is gonna seek on one particular value, in this case, it's the, uh, the value of the card, and all we're looking for that we would normally have to do a lookup in the clustered index, which is the suit of the card, well, why don't we put both of those in the index? Even though I don't necessarily need to order my index based on that second column, if I do that, then at that point, the, the, the storage engine doesn't have to do that lookup at all because the output of my query is covered by this index. And so essentially it's using the indexing mechanism to create a, um, a denormalized or, or, or a finely tuned view of the data. And this was originally, back in my early days, this was a trick that we figured out, but the, the database vendors quickly figured this out. And if you look at SQL Server, I think since SQL Server 2005, they've allowed you to just say includes and add the columns you want the index to include without necessarily having to incur the over overhead of trying to keep that second column, third column, whatever, sorted. So that's a really useful thing to do. But at that point, okay, great. We've got indexes, they make things faster. Why don't we index everything? Well, indexes will always incur some overhead. We have to worry about the index's maintenance, we have to worry about page splits, and we have to worry about page fragmentation. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these things. So let's go back to our phone book example. Let's imagine that we don't have beautiful desktop publishing where, like in a word processor, if I had a row, if I had a line or two of text here, it just naturally flows everything across the rest of the pages. I want you to imagine an era where we had to physically typeset each page, that somebody would have to meticulously and laboriously feed individual letters at a time onto a plate, and that's one page, and we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again, until we have all, I don't know, thousand pages of the Bengaluru phone book. And then your boss comes in and says, oh, we missed three names. Go ahead and, and just add those by the end of the day if you wouldn't mind. Well, it's, it's not gonna work like that. And bosses are always like that. This won't take long, right? No, we have to start over again. Oh, you'll have it by the end of the day. Just, just don't go home until you finish it. And your weeks of work is ruined. And it's the same with a database. Your, those pages are a fixed size. In SQL Server, by default, that's an eight kilobyte page. In MySQL, if you're using the InnoDB storage engine, that's a 16 kilobyte page. And once it's full, there's no more room. 
And so we have, we run into something called a page split. And that's where, let's say we're, we're doing a write, we're inserting a row. Well, the first thing we have to do is insert into that clustered index, insert into the table itself. Then we have to find all of the indexes. And then we have to figure out where those other rows go. It's gonna be in the middle somewhere. And if that page is full, then what we have to do is we have to allocate more space on disk. We're gonna take half of that data and on one of those pages and move it to the new page. And now you're gonna, now you're gonna feed that data in there. So what should be just a couple of bytes of I.O. now is several kilobytes of I.O. And I know that doesn't sound like very much in today's you know, multi-terabyte SSD machines, but when you scale this to the throughput of a live OLTP database, that I.O. can be crippling. And it can really slow things down. And so, as you're, and not only that, when you're doing read I.O. after a page split, the database, the storage engine is going to read a whole page at a time. Whether that page has one row in it, whether that page is 50% full, or whether that page is 100% full, it's still going to do that one unit of I.O., one 8K read, one 16K read. And then it's going to put that entire page into memory. Again, whether it's full or empty, it's allocating the full size of the page. So now you're wasting memory, you're wasting, and again, if you've got a lot of fragmentation, all of your pages are half full, that means all of the RAM you're using for your buffer pool is 50% empty space, but you still have to allocate that RAM. And you're doing 50% of your I.O. is empty reads, but you still have to do that I.O. And this is where you need index maintenance from time to time you need to defragment them. From time to time, you need to rebuild them. And the other thing that, that happens with these databases, with, with these pages, is we have to think now from a design standpoint, how full do we want these pages to be? How much are we optimizing for reads versus how much we're optimizing for writes? Because this is one of those sliders. The more you optimize for read performance, the more you move away from the write performance. And the more you optimize for write performance, the more overhead you're going to incur on all of the reads. And so as a rule of thumb, what we should do is not only understand what our entities and our attributes are, but also have some ideas of the, of the anticipated data access patterns so we can make the right decisions at the table level. In fact, one of the places that I worked, we had an interesting challenge because we had a relational table. Uh, I think we would do it differently today, hopefully. But we had a relational table where we would fire hose uh, something around, something in the order of a million or so uh, writes, a million or so inserts over the course of the workday. And we had to keep that history for query purposes and statistical purposes uh, going back six months. And what we ended up doing was creating uh, two halves of the table. We had one half of the table, or not two halves, but two, two tables. We had the table that we were doing the rights to all day, and the table that had the full history. The table that had the full history and the 180 million, 200 million, 250 million records, that had all of the indexes optimized for the reads. And the table where we were just doing the writes over the course of the day, that had very few indexes. It was optimized for write. And then when we would query that, we had a view that sort of unioned those two together that allowed us to treat them as one, but we could separate our reads and our writes. A couple other indexing tips that are worth covering. Uh, whenever you're building an index, always start with the most selective column first. Always make the first column of your index the column that's going to narrow it down the most. So if, if you're looking at, say, uh, phone number or last name, well, your phone number is gonna, typically going to be more unique than last name. There's a lot of supermoniums. And uh, Venkat, of course, is my favorite. But um, there's a lot of Gandhis. And so start with whatever's going to be the most unique first. 
because this is part of what the query optimizer is going to do when it's going to decide uh, which index that it wants to use. Uh, another one is just adopt an index naming convention. From time to time in my career, I've walked in and people have uh, said, hey, can you look at our database? Can you come in and optimize things a little bit? And I'm sure, and I start looking at the schema, and I see on a table with a dozen columns close to 100 indexes. And I don't even know how that's possible. I can't think of 100 permutations of a dozen columns to get that many indexes. Well, what are these indexes? Well, they all have auto-generated names, so it tells me nothing. And then I actually have to start and query them out and, and look for duplicates and, and actually query the schema and say, oh, well, you've got 20 of this index, you've got 11 of that index, and these are all the same. And remember, the query optimizer has to look at all the different possibilities, even if this is 20 of the exact same index. And every time something is slow, somebody says, oh, well, maybe we need an index. So they just generate a new index on the column they think they want, and it creates one more copy of the same index they already have. If you have an index naming convention, two things happen. One, you can see what's already there just by looking at the table definition. And two, most databases won't let you create two indexes with the same name. So on SQL Server, I use IXC, index clustered, IXN, index non-clustered, underscore, underscore, table name, underscore, underscore, column name, underscore, underscore, second column, and so on. And it's a little bit verbose, but I can look at that, see exactly what it is, and if I try to create a duplicate index, that, that won't work. The database will say, oh, you've already got an index like that, and then I'll say, ah, Maybe I should pay attention. Um, another thing that, that is worth noting, because the key is stored in those leaf pages, and because those leaf pages are a fixed size, we, and we always have to do that quantity of I.O. to read any given page, it's worth thinking about ways to make our indexes as narrow as possible. The narrower our index is, the more data we can fit into a page. In other words, the more data, the more performance we get out of a single unit of I.O. Now, that means that if we have big, long string fields that we want to be able to index, well, those are going to be wide. Those are, some of these columns, the way that we can design databases today, are actually going to overflow those pages which means that you're going to overflow the data into secondary storage called, called lob, large object storage, lob storage. And is there a way that we can make those narrower? Well, if we're looking to match on the entire string, why don't we create an, a second column, a computed column, that just stores a much narrower hash of that string? Now we take a multi-kilobyte, multi-megabyte string and we get it down into a 32, a 64, a 256 byte hash, or bit hash, I mean, a narrow hash, regardless of, of what it is. And that's, gonna, that's a nice design tool to have up your sleeve. You know, one of the, and don't feel bad about having two representations of the same column, because we're, we're living in the real world, not the academic world, and sometimes a little bit of duplication, a little bit of denormalization can be the difference between a, a, a functional successful project or not. And these prefix or hash indexes can do that. Uh, another thing that you can do is if, if you only need part of that string, index just the first 10 characters, or the first 20 characters. These are things that we can do. Uh, so enough on indexes, let's talk a little bit about join operators. Now we know the inner join, outer join, et cetera. Uh, we know these, the cross join, the semi joins. But what's, what's probably, what's more interesting for the context of this conversation is the algorithms that we use, to, that the database uses to implement those joins. And there are three for the most part. There are some variations and some, there is some fine tuning at different points, 
but fundamentally, there's the nested loop join, the merge join, or a key ordered join, I think, in MySQL, and a hash join. Now, if we start with the first one, the nested loop join, if we were doing a whiteboard interview, and I just gave you a marker in front of the whiteboard, and I said, write me an algorithm to do an inner join. That's probably the first algorithm that you would go to. And this is the, uh, the algorithm in pseudocode, but essentially, as you're going through the database, right, you have two tables you want to join. You start here, you read a value, and then you scan for all the matching values. And when you're done, you read the next one, you scan for all the, the matching values, and so on. So this is, you have an outer loop and an inner loop. This is your nested loop join. Now, sometimes when we do a join, we're not really trying to join two relations. What we're really doing is we're trying to test for set existence. We're trying to test for existence or non-existence. This is where we might write a query like, you know, select star from table A, where not exists, subquery to table B. Or the older way to do this is select star from table A, left outer join table B on the join uh, operation where B is null, where there isn't a matching record in the B. So that's, uh, that, the, the, the database engine will do something called a semi-join. And a semi-join is just an early out. That if we're testing for existence of a record, then as soon as we find one, we don't have to keep going. We're like, as long as there's one, we, and then, then we've satisfied the condition that we're looking for, and we can move on to the next row. So it's a, it's a small optimization for that kind of case. Now, the, um, uh, the merge join, or the key ordered scan, is a much more efficient algorithm in terms of, uh, you know, operating at the, at the order of O-N instead of O-N squared. And essentially, this works if both of your tables are already sorted by the join key. So let's say I create a table, and that table is invoice. I have an invoice table and an invoice items table. Well, if I follow all of my defaults, and I say, well, I'm going to create my index table, so I've got invoice ID, uh, client ID, date, whatever, whatever, whatever for the invoice, and then I create an invoice item table, well, my default would be invoice item ID, primary key clustered, so key on that, and then I've got, you know, quantity and SKU and description and price, etc., and then I've got the parent and child relationship. Well, that means that if I want to build that invoice, for display, I've got to do that nested loop join. Well, what if I made a different decision? What if I said my primary key on the invoice item table is invoice item ID, but the clustered key is invoice ID? Well, now they're both sorted by invoice ID. And what that means is that I can do this algorithm and get my invoice ID 1, and because they're all sorted, I can say, well, there's my one, there's my one, there's my one, there's my one. Whoop, that's a two. I can stop. And then I read the second one. Okay, two. There's my twos. There's my threes. There's my fours. And so I make one single path pass through both sets. Understanding this algorithm will drive some of your database design decisions. Now, the third one that we're going to talk about is a hash join. And a hash join is a useful join algorithm when in situations like there is no index. Because it allows, the, it allows the storage engine essentially to build an index on the fly. So it's going to take one of your sets of tables, and it's going to start hashing all of those values and pushing those values into a hash table. And on the other side, we're going we're to probe. So as we're doing the join, I'm going to read that value, I'm going to hash it, and then I'm going to probe that hash table and see if there are any matches. And so 
Hash tables are expensive to build, but hash tables are very, very, very fast to do lookups. And that's essentially, that's essentially what this algorithm does. Now, sometimes we have the indexes, but the, the, the query optimizer says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a hash join. And we look at it and say, why? It's so computationally expensive to build that hash table and probe that hash table. But hash joins have one advantage that the other two join algorithms don't. And that is that they parallelize really well. That it's very easy to take all of that and start dividing up that work across threads. We can multi-thread the build. We can multi-thread the probe. They parallelize really, really well. So the key thing, of course, is just watch out for memory usage. And this is why, by the way, we want to keep doing the right things around make, take, making sure our indexes are ma maintained, that our statistics are up to date, because our statistics are basically guesses of what the database looks like and what the data looks like. And so if your statistics are out of date, the query optimizer is going to say, well, we need this much memory. And then when you start building this, it turns out you need this much memory. And this is where things get really ugly really fast. You run into something called the hash bailout, where you run out of space. And so you have to take part of that hash table and flush it onto disk, which is slow. And then you've got to read something else from disk to replace it, which is slow. And if you're parallelizing this, that means you've got different threads that want to be probing different parts of the hash table, and so you're constantly swapping and thrashing, and uh, it can be really problematic. We'll talk a little bit about database design. We've got about 15 minutes left, and uh, you know we're generally fairly familiar with normalization. I think even if we don't know the dictionary definitions of each normal form, third normal form, and and um, voice cod normal form, and fourth normal form, and fifth normal form, and so on, we have a good intuition to how to do this design. Now, there's this myth that popped up about 10 or 12 years ago when we had our first wave of NoSQL hype. And by the way, I, I want to be clear. In, in, in the work that I do, I use relational databases, I use non-relational databases, I use key value stores, I use graph databases, but I try to use the right tool for the job. And if your data is inherently relational, you're going to have a bad time trying to put that into a non-relational store. You're going to do a lot of additional work, a lot of more, a lot more I.O., network I.O., a lot more compute as you're trying to do like application side joins to do what this type of database was designed for. It's all about using the right tool for the job. I don't, store, I don't try to store graphs in relational databases, and I don't try to store relational data in document databases or anything like that. But there was this notion that came up that the only reason that we did database normalization was because in the 1970s, when Ed Codd was around, storage was expensive. Now, that is true, but we still have the underlying problems, the, the logical problems that drove relational database design in the first place. You know, these are good checks on our design, on our data model. We want to avoid redundancy. That can get really expensive. Uh, and if we, and not only that, logical inconsistencies can be really expensive and really problematic. Uh, it's a way to validate, does your model make sense, and how well is your model going to be able to change as we move? And one mistake people do is this, uh, this ERD sinkhole anti-pattern where our data model, where, where we use our ORM to just make objects out of tables, where our data model is our object model, which is our resource model and our REST API, and all the way down. You know, the whole idea of having an ORM is to be able to abstract a relational model from an object model. So just a useful thing to think about. Um, so a couple other things as you're designing databases. You want to choose your data, data types wisely. Narrower columns are usually better. 
And we talked about why that is, because you've got a fixed amount of space on a page, and an index, the narrow that index is, the better it's going to perform. I've got, I've got this on here, and I've really been meaning to take this bullet point off, and avoid nulls where possible. Um, at some point, there was a little bit of overhead that would come from using nullable data types. Uh, but I keep benchmarking this on, on modern relational databases, and I can't find a performance hit or a meaningful performance hit. And the other thing I think is important is null means something. Null basically means I don't know. And if I have a value, if I have an empty string value for your phone number, that's not your phone number, is it? It means I don't know what your phone number is, but, but I'm actually, I'm putting a value there. Uh, and, and so a, a lot of times null is the right thing to do. Uh, simple types versus complex types. Uh, a really good example is uh, don't store dates as strings. Your strings are going to be a lot wider than a date. Okay. Oh, good. You're, yeah. Uh, your strings are going to be a lot wider than a date, and, uh, and, and it's going to be harder to do things with that. Uh, or even I don't store IP addresses as strings. I store them as, as, a, as a representation of the four octets uh, for IPv4 uh, IP addresses. Uh, the other one is uh, way when you want to use uh, a fixed length character columns versus variable length character columns. Because again, this is going to make the query optimizer's job easier. If you know it's only ever going to be up to 10 characters, sometimes it's worth taking the hit to allocate those 10 characters even if it's empty. Because one, it means that when I write into that column, it's, going, it's not going to have to reallocate all of my pages and incur more page splits or anything like that. But also, it, um, it's going to be a whole lot easier for the query optimizer to make decisions because this column is only going to be X bytes wide ever. So it can make a lot more informed decisions about, about uh, column width. Now at the same time, if you do need a variable length column, use it. Because don't pre-allocate 100K for this column when most of the time you're using that, but sometimes you need 100K. So these are just things to think about. Uh, we talked a little bit about ORMs and your models. Uh, you know, a couple things. Beware of auto-generated schema. Uh, ignore those bullet points. But beware of some of the automated, the, the, the auto-generated schema. A lot of our tools, we can point it to an object model and it'll go and generate tables. You've got a string column in your, uh, you've got, let's say you've got a person class. And your person class has an email address. And your email is stored as a string. How long is a string? I can tell you how long an email address is, but the, your ORM doesn't understand the semantics of that property. It just knows what a string is. And a string can be, you know, four gigabytes. So it's going to just say, I guess that's a Varkar max. And everything is a Varkar max. So you want to be mindful that, a, that an email address can only be 320 characters, by definition. The, the identity and the domain can't be longer than 320 characters. A uh, couple other things as we wrap up. We've got about 10 minutes left. Talk a little bit about query optimization. Because as you're seeing this, as you know the roles of the different components of, your, of the database engine, of the database management system, you know, and how data types can affect performance, and how indexes can affect performance, and how database design can affect what types of joins you can do. And all of that, you know, we'll come up with a, a couple basic tips that are just, just useful to, to think about. Don't ask for more than you need. Use limit. Uh, use, uh, don't, don't select star. Don't, uh, don't fetch all the columns from a multi-table join if you don't need them. Now, most of the time, again, we're using ORMs, and they're generally making the, 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 the right, uh, the, the right uh, number of columns, and they, they apply the right limits in general. But it's also useful to take advantage of lazy loading in times where that's going to be valued, because that's, that's going to keep you from pulling more data than you need in any given query. Uh, another thing is learn how to read a query plan. Look at it and look at the execution time. Look how many rows are examined versus rows that are returned. That's a big 
flashing sign pointing at uh, where maybe an index would be valuable. Uh, learn where to find bottlenecks. In MySQL, there's the slow query log, which is not very useful by itself, but there are tools that'll analyze it and give you reports. Uh, more robust, enterprise-y database engines have a variety of tools. And it's useful to have at least a, you know, level one, level two familiarity with these tools to be able to take advantage of them. Um, dynamic management views. This is one of my favorite things that came out, I think, in SQL Server 2005 or 2008. It gives you a lot of operational data. I can look at this and it'll say, hey, here's all the queries by frequency. Here's the indexes that get used the most. Here's the indexes that get used the use. Here's the indexes that you've been running for a month and a half and you've never used. Uh, really valuable tools uh, to get in there on the optimization. Uh, yeah, learn how to read query plans. We've covered that. Uh, so now that we've kind of got this, this is a question that I answered on Stack Overflow. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to poll the audience. because uh, So this is a question that came up. Uh, I want to test if something is older than three months. And there are two, there are two queries. And uh, one is my answer to this Stack Overflow question, the other is somebody else's. Uh, they both will work. They will both give you the same result. Which one is better? And I get it, nobody wants to hazard a guess. Uh, in fact, it will be the bottom one here. And here's why. If you, if you look at the first one, it actually has to pass in the value of manufactured date into this function for every row. That means it has to calculate, evaluate that expression for every single row of data. Whereas mine, we calculate three months ago once, we fold that into a constant, and then we can use that as a search argument. That's what this sargable query uh, concept means that we can construct a search argument rather than having to evaluate for every row in the database. Again, things to think about because like Visual Basic, there's a lot of ways to get the same result, but they, but they are not all created equal. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to take big queries and restructure them, break them down into smaller parts. Uh, that was one of my go-to tools in my query optimization toolbox using temp tables and moving, you know, materializing intermediary data into a temp table that has the right index structure and table structure, when I do the second part of the query, I can get the more optimal join operator. The last thing I'm going to say in our last five minutes here is talk just a little bit about this idea of set thinking. Because one key thing that you have to understand out of everything that I've talked about today, I think this is the most important point. The most important point is understanding the query optimizer, its role, its job, how all of it works. So SQL is a declarative language. You are not telling, you are not telling the database what to do. This is a major contrast with imperative style programming. You are describing the result set you want back. I want, a res I want a result set back that is this shape and meets this criteria. Great. It is the job of the query optimizer to determine the most efficient way to get that. But we tend to go from higher level, imperative, functional, object-oriented languages to SQL, and we don't always shift the mindset. So we go in there saying, oh, well, what I want to do is I want to treat this table as a collection or a list, and I want to iterate over this list, and I want to do something to every row on this list. And we look at the database and we say, well, I guess what we want here is a for loop. Oh, well, how do I for loop in SQL? Oh, that's called a cursor. Great. And then you write this and you have just obliterated any possibility for the storage engine or the query optimizer to optimize what you want to do. So instead, you're describing a transform on a set. You're describing a result set that you want back. Let the optimizer do its job. 
And when you're doing this imperative style programming, you're preventing the optimizer from doing its job. And the best advice that I've ever gotten was from, uh, from a person now, I used to be very active on a SQL Server forum way back in the day. And uh, one of the other very active individuals uh, was a gentleman by the name of Jeff Moden. And this was his advice, and I think this is, uh, this is golden advice if you want to be able to change mental paradigms from imperative, OO, functional style languages to declarative languages like SQL. Stop thinking about what you want to do to a row, and instead, think about what you want to do to the column. And I think we've covered everything that I want to cover. Uh, my name is Michael Carducci. If you have questions, if you want to reach out, you can find me on Mastodon, at Michael Carducci at mastodon.social. You can email me, michael at magician.codes. And uh, I will, of course, be here all week. And I am so grateful to be live and in person with all of you. And with that, I will say thank you. Enjoy the day. Thank you.